Howdy guys, Attorney Walter Not. Let's get right to it. As you guys know, please remember to like, subscribe, and leave five-star reviews. Now here is a very special video. We have the president of a, a huge nonprofit in Washington, D.C. coming on the show. Uh, we're going to get him joined in pretty soon. We're going to wait until basically we get enough people loaded into the actual room to begin the show. And uh, this is Mr. Bill Arnone, a really incredible, incredible person. And the reason why is that he yesterday... Uh, had basically a live show through the National Academy of Social Insurance, right, where he got to communicate with, question, go through the details of the most recent information from the chief actuary of the SSA on what's happening with the trust funds. And through this report, they talk about how many applicants there are for disability, what's going on with the numbers, are things looking good, are things looking bad? And what's incredible about it is that we're starting to see, we're starting to learn that there are some major hurdles in front of us and that things are not looking as good as we would all hope they would. When I bring this gentleman on the show, um, I want you to keep in mind that uh, basically we'll be taking some of the questions from the chat section and then essentially going ahead and uh, basically asking him some of those at the very end. I want you to also keep in mind uh, please be respectful. Uh, this is a gentleman who basically is in the head honcho position of uh, a really incredible nonprofit that does amazing work on behalf of your rights and freedoms as disabled and retired individuals. This is an individual, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, sugarcoated. I'm not putting in any way other than what it really is here. Who speaks with and talks with and interacts with the highest levels of the United States government. So my point to you with this whole situation is that if you have a very serious question that you can frame in a very good way, you know, you write it out so that I can read it and then give it to him at the very end of the of the questions that I want to give him, the tough grill questions that I have planned, please write them into the chat section because we will uh, basically be going ahead and going through those. Now, with that said, uh, I have a few announcements before we go ahead and get him on the show. Uh, a couple of basics here. Uh, the future of this channel is going to have uh, a lot of new guests coming on in the not too distant future. Uh, some of them will be related to the tools that are specifically used and created by professionals in the disability marketplace. And what I'm saying to you is we're going to get people who build the programs and functions that everybody uses inside of Social Security uh, to go ahead and be on the show and talk about the benefits and issues that are facing the future of this industry. We're also going to have uh, basically actual disabled individuals telling their stories to what happened and some of the unique stories that they have so that you can hear and avoid some of the sand traps that they fell into. We will also have some product placement in the not too distant future on this show, uh, specifically for disabled individuals and also tutorials on how to complete things uh, around your dwelling. Because, you know, a lot of you guys, something will break and it'll just stay broken and it'll never get fixed. Well, I'm going to show you basically the things that I learned while rebuilding this rental home. Now, big announcement, huge announcement. As of yesterday, once again, as of yesterday, that house that I had been working on for the past three months officially closed uh, with Launch Credit Union and federal title. And uh, I have a few little things I want to do here and there, and then basically it will go into the rental phase, in which case I'll be showing with you guys uh, basically the contract, the details, what I'm looking at, how it's going to come together so you can see the future of this place as a rental. This is important because some of you guys will have a form of you know, funds coming in could be, you know, where you're basically receiving funds from somebody who passed away and left you some money could be you win some lottery thing could be whatever an insurance claim, whatever you're going to get to see uh, detail by detail. What I did, you're going to get to see detail by detail, the screw ups I made so that you can go forward and basically get your own rental home set up. And the reason I think this is incredibly important is that a lot of this channel focuses on what the future of disability and retirement benefits are going to be. But we need to focus more heavily on, I think, two particular aspects. Number one, how do you invest into something that really gives you a lot of money back? Not like a cute little investment of 5% back every so often. I mean a real, it pays you every month to have it. Then the other thing that I think is important is we need to talk a little bit more about the idea of essentially prepping. 
as you've noticed, the Senate and House are starting to come out with different uh, rules, different bills that they would like to pass related to uh, basically war, related to battles, related to interaction with other countries. I've noticed this. I didn't think of it much at first, but I think what's happening is uh, the Senate and House are starting to prepare for things that which we do not have privy to. And as a result of that, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that they are planning for something big to occur. Um, a lot of people always argue the timelines on this stuff and the relevance of it, like where was COVID in this and the politics of that. And the and I understand that. But um, what I think we all need to be aware of is how to be a little bit more prepared uh, for these uh, tragic events that are likely to be coming in the not too distant future. And I don't say that lightly. I say it very heavily because I know that Unfortunately, those who are disabled are retired, limited income, super, super limited income. And uh, the problem inherent with that is that in order to prep, be prepared, whatever you want to call it, I know people call them preppers and stuff like that. Whatever you want to do to be prepared is going to be more of a financial danger to you. And it's it's so simple, like simple stuff. That's really tough. You know, how do you go ahead and store enough water to be able to use it uh, during those times? Because remember, a lot of the stuff that you have that you can purchase in preparation for a problem requires water, whether it's, you know, food where you add water or it's a plant where it requires water, all that stuff. So we're going to start going through that, but we're going to do it from a retired and disabled person's perspective of how to approach it. And I mean, like, you know, everything from they can't lift something that's heavy. What do you do? Uh, you can't get outside. What do you do? All of those functions. So uh, I'm now going to take a moment uh, and go ahead and reach out uh, to Mr. Uh, Bill Arnone. As I stated before, he is the president uh, or CEO, as you want to put it, of the National Academy for Social Insurance, which is one of the largest nonprofits out there that pretty much works with high-level individuals, executives, and many, many of their members are high-level individuals inside the government uh, to go ahead and enhance uh, ideas uh, to promote basically potential uh, of what this program could be, how it could change, what it could be to actually benefit you in the long run. Um, they're neutral. So when you guys come up with political statements in the chat section, remember they remain neutral. They don't uh, they don't say you have to do this or you know this president versus that president. They remain neutral. So please keep that in mind as we go forward because it is incredibly important uh, for you to understand that when you ask a question uh, after I get to ask my questions, uh, they need to remain politically neutral. Uh, throughout this process. Okay. I'm going to reach out right now and see if I can get the gentleman on the phone. Let's see what we can do. And hopefully we can, and we're going to get that volume up. We're going to put the phone into the holder. Hello, Walter. Howdy. Good, sir. How are you doing? Well, I'm just getting back to my apartment. Hang on a second. Perfect. Perfect. In DC, we just had something close to a tornado. If you can believe that. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Oh. We get like summer weather and then all of a sudden it turned. Oh, well. Let me just get back inside and then I'm ready to go. Perfect, good sir. Excellent. While you're getting ready, um, I, I've, I've notified all the viewers. We've got about 150 so far. Probably bump up a little bit more from Super. there. Yeah, I've notified them that, uh, A, to keep things away from politics, um, that they'll have a chance. <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Everything's saucy right now. It's very salty and, and, and fresh and, they just, and, and right out of the water. But um, I would say this. Um, <laughs> So basically, uh, the big thing that they're uh, very excited about is asking questions at the end. So would you yeah. be okay if, if they got a chance to ask you some questions at the end of the show? I even would, would welcome them during the show. I'm, uh, I love interaction. So however you want to manage it, Perfect. Uh, I, I thrive on questions. So yes. Perfect. 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 So let me know when you're ready. Um, and I'll go ahead and I've prepared some, some particularly difficult questions. So yeah, I, I yes, oh, good, 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 good. I hope the tornado didn't scare you too much. <laughs> Just, you know. I'll tell you the whole front of the restaurant caved in that I was at. It was shocking. Wow. We were ready. Yeah. Washington is not uh, ready for things like this <laughs> among other things, but it was quite a, uh, Wow. Feeling. And Jeez. I am now in my apartment, safe and sound. So I'm ready when you are. Wow. Well, congratulations from surviving a, a, a literal storm <laughs> collapse uh, with, a, with a storefront. Wow. Um, Crazy. Jeez Louise. Um, 
So uh, when it comes to these questions, I, I thought about it a lot and I've already kind of told the crowd, you know, basically at the end of the day, you recently had this amazing interview, this, uh, this, this, this meeting with the chief actuary of the SSA related to trust funds, what's going on. And people are worried about trust funds running out, you know, yeah. Medicare retirement. What factors cause the retirement trust fund uh, to have, you know, this expe expected depletion over the next, you know, 10 years? What causes gains in that trust fund? What causes losses in that trust fund? Yes, and we're on now, and I can uh, answer that right now. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah well, uh, first of all, uh, great to be back with you. I enjoyed my last uh, session with you and look forward to uh, responding to questions. Um the trust fund, I just want to make sure people understand what the trust fund is. It's not all of Social Security. It's a reserve that's meant to supplement the payment of benefits when the dollars you and I put in through contributions are not enough. And for the past few years, those dollars have not been enough. So little by little, the trustees have been dipping into these reserves that are in the trust fund in order to supplement the dollars that we provide to our contributions to that four-letter word FICA. So these trust funds have accumulated an enormous reserve, almost $2.9 trillion, if you can imagine that. And they are subject to fluctuations that come in two categories, economic fluctuations and demographic fluctuations. On the economic side, the big ones are the rate of employment, and I'll simplify, the higher the rate of unemployment, the worse the trust funds do. And you might say, why? Fewer people contributing into the system. The second is inflation. The higher inflation, the more benefits get paid out, and that puts an added strain on the trust fund. Uh, and the third, and this is a really important factor, it's called productivity, and what it really is is real wage growth. So let's say your pay goes up uh, – 6% and inflation is 5%, you have a 1% real wage growth. That is productivity. That's what productivity is measured by by economists. So that's the third economic variable. If those things go in the wrong direction, the trust funds start to pay out more. The demographic side is more long term. And that is usually a couple of key factors. Life expectancy, the longer people live, the more Social Security pays out. And that hurts the trust fund. I know it sounds odd that something we should celebrate, right? Long life hurts the trust fund. The second is fertility. And this is a big long-term deal. Women are not producing enough children. I hate to put it so bluntly. And right now, the fertility rate is 1.7. Uh, that is way below what's needed to sustain a population of future workers. You need about two children per person, per woman. So those are the two demographic variables. And then you've got other things like immigration that affect it. But those are the big factors that determine how well the trust funds are set up for the future. And in the last 10 years, the trust funds have been tapped in order to pay benefits because of these uh, different variables that are going in the wrong direction by and large. So that was really good. Um, just to summarize, unemployment, inflation, productivity, length of life, fertility. Um, let me ask you this. W when it comes to those factors, and it seems like you know most of them are going in the wrong direction, um, explain to me this. What percentage are these trust funds in their relevance to the overall payout per month for the average retired or disabled person? Yeah, today they play a minimal role, uh, probably about... 2% of benefits today are being paid out of the trust funds. But if we do nothing, and no one uh, thinks that, despite the paralysis in Washington, no one thinks Congress is going to do nothing. They have to do something. But let's say, God forbid, they waited until 2034. If you look at the two trust funds, you know, actually two trust funds. One trust fund pays for what most people think of as Social Security, retirement, survivor, and spouse. The other pays for disability. You put those two together, and if Congress does nothing, they won't have enough money by 2034 to pay all the benefits due. Now, what does that mean? There'll be a 20% shortfall. And that means if Congress does nothing, there's an across-the-board cut 
of 20% in everybody's Social Security. No one thinks that will actually happen. But as of today, and now we've got a decade to go, uh, Congress hasn't been able to come up with a deal. So they play a bigger and bigger role going forward, but it's never uh, more than 20%. So to that extent, 80% of the benefits are okay, even if the trust fund gets depleted. So which trust fund is in more trouble? You know, I've been going over the math and looking at the charts. I looked at Medicare. I looked at retirement, which, I mean, Medicare, you know, they're saying that one's going to be the worst one first. But, I mean, to me, retirement's in more trouble. Which one's in more trouble? Well, if you look at the depletion date, Medicare's depletion date is earlier. But Medicare added two years to their trust fund. So they actually had a better year. Social Security had a worse year. The Social Security old age survivor and uh, spouses of the trust fund went the wrong direction. They moved down a year. The strongest of all, believe it or not, is the disability trust fund. That trust fund is in great shape for the entire period the actuaries use, which is 75 years. Ten years ago, the disability trust fund was in deep trouble. Something is going on. I think you may have heard the chief actuary say, mm -hmm. we don't know why disability benefits are going down. Fewer people are applying. Fewer people are getting a benefit, and they don't really know what is the big reason for the disability program to be doing so well. It's doing so well because fewer people are getting benefits. But that's that's a big change in how the disability program has been over the past X years. I think the big thing, uh, the, the mega change, was in 2017 um, with the change of appealing to appeals council because the yo-yo effect going up and coming back down uh, for weight of evidence standard claims, uh, and then getting in front of a judge again, and then going up. You know, you go in front of the same judge uh, twice after the first one, and then the third time you get an AC remand, you get a new judge, and the new judge would usually just look at it. You know, you'd pick a new AOD and then approve. But that whole yo-yo effect and then approval was cut out, um, which which really from 2017 cut out a lot of those middle gray area claims. And I think the other side of the coin is, you know, if, if you look at the statistical changes of the, uh, you know, ALJs approving over the past 10 to 15 years, we, we see a graph downward trend of uh, the courtroom doors slowly closing on how many approvals there are. And then, you know, on top of that, I've noticed there's the, uh, the, the, the way that these judges are trained, the way that they're hired is now completely under a separate group being the Social Security Administration's a uh, little byproduct group that trains them as opposed to where it was a more neutral group previously. But um, you know, it's it's very interesting because uh, I, I see a lot of things, but I, I'm glad to see the disability trust fund is safe. Um, but, you know, the other thing with the Medicare, how does how do, I wanted to ask you about this because you definitely know more about the Medicare side than I do. Since people pay in each year, you know, like with retirement, you know, once you take retirement, you're not paying an amount in per month for retirement. But Medicare, you pay that extra amount in. Do they have that as like a get out of jail free car where they can get out of this problem with Medicare by just raising the monthly rate? Or is that how they're going to go ahead and try and climb their way out the fastest? Well, let me address that. But first, I want to echo what you said on the disability uh, the the adjudication system, no question about it, that uh, there was something going on there. In fact, you mentioned it's a question of the types of people that are hired, but there was a performance metric that was put in place. The more appeals that you uh, over, in other words, when you an, an appeal overturned the initial denial, your uh, performance review got affected. Can you imagine mm -hmm. that? Oh, that yeah, was yeah. Not really, yeah. Yeah, that was really not publicized. That was a devastating thing. The other factor, though, we have to be honest, because of COVID, field offices were closed for over two years. Walter, can you get a disability benefit without a face-to-face -face interview? Um, I mean, how do you do it, right? It's tough. It, it's definitely, so the, the way it changed was that, and the main, the main faculty of that was that SSDI benefits were way ahead technology-wise when it comes to applying. And people could apply online and they had the whole system set up. SSI benefits, to my understanding, as of last week in checking, still to this day cannot be applied for online, which means that oh, yeah, the grand majority of individuals that are caseworkers working at homeless help centers, low-income family help centers, uh, can't actually apply people using that method. So the only options available are call them up, 
um, fill out the forms and send them in, or, and there's very few disability attorneys that do it. We do it, but you know, we, we have a huge population of low income and homeless, you know, claimants, but you know, having a disability attorney basically sit there, fill it out with you and then mail in the initials, but it's, it's a by phone or paperwork, uh, kind of gig. Uh, and, and the, gotcha. yeah. And the, the thing is they could fix that very quickly, but the other problem is because SSI has a zillion more restrictions to it than SSDI benefits, the 8000 VK, which is the SSI application, or the 8001, which is like the, the skinny version of that, um, they're much, much more complex initial filing forms than the SSDI yes. you know, 16 BK form. So that's another hurdle. Like, you know, I, I actually on Wednesday, I went from the homeless center uh, and then I went directly from there to somebody's house to help them fill out the forms. And, you know, they got three pages in and, you know, it's like an IRS thing. If this go to 15, if this go to 16 B, if this go to 18, nine, you know, part C. And, um, the, the ironic thing about it is that if you look at VA benefits, they've got this standard where they've got to help people. But with SSI, there's no standard where they're required to reach out and kind of like do these things. Now I will say this commissioner Kijikazi was reaching out to, you know, different native and not just native Americans, but different native groups and doing that VA thing of going above and beyond and finding the people that need the benefits. And that I applaud in a huge way because, you know, that having a government agency that didn't have that requirement, then go and try and find the people who need the help and the benefits is, you know, that's, that's where you're, you're applauding for five minutes. Um, so very, very yes. pleased with her yes. in that. Um, but I'll tell yeah. you that, and I'm a big, as you know, a huge fan of her. She's a phenomenal leader. But there are two numbers that haunt her. One, the backlog today of SSDI and SSI disability claims is one million. Can you oh, imagine that? Jeez. And in any given year, 10,000 people die while waiting for their disability claim to be approved. Those two numbers are just shameful right when you think about it yeah. so something has to be done and she's aware of this and it's a top priority for her uh medicare is a is a much more complicated problem than social security i like to tell people look both programs need change social security is relatively easy you can really fix social security relatively easily medicare it's much more difficult because it's part of a bigger healthcare system that is a patchwork of uh, confusing, uh, difficult, <laughs> challenging ways to pay for health care. Medicare has four parts. That alone c- confuses people. Part A is what we pay for while we're working. It's the hospital benefit. You pay for that while you're working. Once you stop working, you just don't pay in. And at 65, you, you're covered. It's automatic coverage. Part B is very different. You don't pay for Part B until you start getting it and you pay a premium. So unlike part A, you pay for it when you're working, part B, you pay for it after you work. And the premiums, by the way, keep going up and, which is a part of of social insurance that people object to, they are based on income. The more income you have, the higher the premium you pay. Um, And at some point, we have to be honest with ourselves, Medicare will become a bad deal for higher income beneficiaries. Now, some of your uh, listeners might say, well, so what? <laughs> they can afford it, let them pay more. Well, yes, but social insurance depends on everyone feeling they're in it together and they're all benefiting together. If you go too far with uh, kind of a soak the rich approach, um, it could backfire. I'm not saying it will backfire, but it could. Then you have part C, which is in the news now, Medicare Advantage. That is where private insurers are running the Medicare Advantage program. And you know why they are. It's profit. There's profit there. And there's a lot of questions about whether it is uh, providing excess profits to providers. And then Part D is the new drug benefit. I say new. It's only been around for uh, maybe 20 years. Um, And that's the one that provides a drug benefit. Again, you pay for that when you're on Medicare. You don't pay for that before. So just when you think of how complicated we've made Medicare, you can see why people are totally confused and what makes it worse you go on part d you gotta uh, decide decide among maybe 20 different plans that's how confusing it is and they all differ and part c medicare advantage there are probably a dozen different plans um i've heard people on the phone try to figure out what to do and they've broken down in tears out of frustration 
I don't understand. Tell me what to do. And of course, Medicare is not going to tell you what plan to pick. You got to pick that on your own. So we've created a, a real confusing, perplexing morass when it comes to Medicare, which is a, a real problem. So I wanted to ask you this, and it's a tough question, and I'm not trying to go political with it in any way, but if a war were to occur that required significant funding, as they always do, and our usual lenders like the American people, Japan, China, Ireland, were no longer in a liquid position, they didn't have the cash to give to us in a loan, could Congress theoretically create Social Security Trust Fund borrowing legislation? Well, keep in mind, the trust fund today is consisting of one thing, treasury securities. Mm -hmm. They are loans to the federal government. The government's already borrowing from Social Security. That's what a bond is. But here's an idea that I don't know if it's being proposed in anticipation of a war. God forbid. It's like, can you just imagine a, a war, what it would do to everyone? But... There's an idea out there that's starting to take root, and it's called a sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. The idea is Social Security's trustees would create a new trust fund that invested in the market, not bonds, but equities. And the idea is that would supplement the current trust fund, which by law can only invest in government securities. Keep an eye on this. This could be one of those things that comes out of nowhere and could have a, a, a positive effect. So it's worth watching. But I, I, I'm here, I'll inject my own view. I'm haunted by the thought of World War III. Can you imagine that? Yeah. I didn't live to World War II. My father did. He was a veteran. The thought of, of us going in that direction as a, as a human race, not just the United States, it's terrifying. And, uh, you know, all I can say is God help us. So I got to ask you, you know, we're, we're 10, 11 years away from a catastrophe without action. And a lot of us believe very strongly. And uh, that sovereign fund, we did a couple of videos on it on the channel about it. And that came out of nowhere from politicians kind of in the middle, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, some of these catastrophes with social insurance benefits, retirement, disability, survivors, some will be avoided, some will not. Which do you feel will be the first catastrophe avoided? And also, which do you feel will be the first catastrophe to occur? Well, um, I do think, I'm going to answer in the reverse, that the one that has the least likelihood of occurring is the Social Security Old Age Survivor Insurance Program. Um, that, as I said earlier, can be remedied, but it will involve the two parties giving in on two issues that will be, I think, the key issues. The Democrats' answer to Social Security is bring in more money. Mm -hmm. Apply FICA to all wages. Don't cap it at 160000 or next year it's capped at 167000 Apply it to all wages or most wages. They also are saying, can we apply this Social Security contribution rate, FICA, to other kinds of income? Could we apply it to investment income? Could we apply it to capital gains? Uh, could we resurrect the estate tax and dedicate that to Social Security? That's the Democrats' emphasis, bring more money in. And as you might expect, the Republicans' emphasis is cut the money that goes out, cut the benefits somehow. And they are more focused on two cuts. One, raise the retirement age. Now you might say, is that a cut? That's a delay in benefits. Is it a cut? It's a cut <laughs> because every year you delay the normal age and the age now for boomers is 66, for millennials is 67. Uh, some would want to raise that age to 70. That is a huge cut because when the normal age is raised, the early age, you take a bigger cut in the benefit. That's a serious cut. And Republicans seem to want to go in that direction. The other thing they want to do, at least they've talked about it, one of the beauties of Social Security is it goes up every year based on the cost of living, the consumer price index. And they're saying, well, should it be 100% of the consumer price index? Maybe we should just give a COLA that's 50% of inflation, not 100%. So those are the two things I think the Republicans will be focused on. Those, I think, are the makings of a deal that could actually occur this year. 
they're talking about it behind the scenes. So I would say stay tuned. And that would avoid a Social Security catastrophe. Again, catastrophe doesn't mean there's no Social Security. It just means the benefits are cut 20% across the board. So I would keep an eye on that. Disability seems like it's so, uh, doing so well. There's probably not going to be much action there unless it starts to turn around. The big unknown there, as you heard from the actuary, is long COVID. We don't know what the impact of long COVID will be on disability. That's a big mystery. So we can't get too carried away with the decline in disability benefits. That could change overnight. Medicare, though, will be the biggest one that is the most difficult one to solve. And with Medicare, the question is, who's going to pay if we don't solve it? Will beneficiaries pay? Will providers pay? Will insurers pay? Or will everybody pay? And right now, I don't think anybody knows what the, the formula will be with Medicare. So let me ask you this, and I think that's a good, I think that that answers it very well. What is the potential catastrophe that we just can't calculate? And that would be the long COVID. But what what would be some good news in the financial information report uh, communication, the meeting you have with Stephen Goss, uh, Steve Goss, uh, that was you know released by him uh, in that meeting that we can kind of hold on to in our hearts as progress that leads to better solutions? The good news short term is always economics. If we can keep unemployment down, if we can keep productivity up, and if we can inf- keep inflation down, the picture will change dramatically. Those, I think, are the three economic variables that affect Social Security in the short term. What are the probabilities of that? Well, that's what actuaries do. They, they, they uh, calculate probabilities. The probability of all of them going in the right direction is not high. So again, you gotta, we got to keep an eye on that. Um, I don't think there's an appetite now to suddenly discover new revenues that can be injected into Social Security. I think it sounds good, but I don't know if we have the appetite to do that. I mean, can you imagine someone who's retired and takes money out of their IRA, uh, and in addition to paying income tax on it, they're going to pay additional Social Security tax on it? That's a hard sell, right? You'll say, yeah. and say wait a minute, I've already paid, I'm paying again? So I don't know how far we can go with the bring new revenues in. I think that's that's somewhat problematic. But those are things, the economics, if they happen in the right direction, they can make a big, big difference. Short term, long term, I don't know what we do to change the fertility rate in this country. Other countries around the world have the same. But look at China. China had a one-child policy. Women are not having children in China. They don't want to have children. And you can't blame them, right? So the whole world is faced with this fertility crisis. There are very few countries in the world that the fertility rate is is at a sustainable level. And then life expectancy, you know, it's painful to look at this, but uh, one of the, I I hate to use the word best things, but one of the things that helped Medicare add three years to its trust fund was that COVID killed off the most expensive Medicare beneficiaries. True. Is this something we should celebrate? I mean, seriously? But that was the reality of COVID. It declared war on older people. True. And uh, Medicare benefited from that. But that's, I mean, is that the way we want to base policy and hope more? we have more more pandemics? I mean, that really is not an answer, right? So I want to ask you, I want to ask you an extra tough question because it's relevant to me. You know, April 25th, I'm turning 37 and I just did the first financially smart thing for my future, which was essentially, you know, work on this house, rebuild it, renovate it, you know, finish uh, all the closing details. Now I can rent it. I pay it off over 25 years. That puts me into my 60s. And then basically at that point, it's paid off and the rent is, you know, 100 percent in. Um, let me ask you this. What are things that the youth should be doing to increase their preparedness for a future where retirement might not be as valuable uh, as it is nowadays? Well, as the father of a millennial, she's a little younger than you. Sure. I tell her, look at your 401k plan and contribute the maximum you can. Many times workers contribute up to whatever the employer matches. That's not enough. You've got to put in more. And I would say find the money. You'll never miss it. You'll get a tax break up front. You can't save enough. Um, so to me, that's a, I know it's a simple answer and it's maybe not realistic. Many people and they got so many other demands on their money. But that's the number one message I tell people is just 
find a way to save as much as you can. It'll never hurt you. Um, and then for long-term planning purposes, a lot of financial planners, they sit down with people your age. I don't know if you've had a, a experience. They'll say, you know what? Let's forget Social Security. You might not be there for you. And let's try and do a plan without it. Well, to me, that is just not a good way to look at Social Security. It will be there. It might not pay 100% of what you expect. So play what if. Let's say, okay, let's say it only pays 80% of what I expect. What does that do to the rest of my plan? Or I'll go worst case. Let's say it only provides 50%. But the thought of putting zero in for Social Security, to me, a financial planner that says let's ignore it, is just not uh, being, uh, I think, uh, a solid planner for his or her clients. Um, so I think you've got to get a realistic perspective in. The other thing I hear, uh, I don't know if you do this, and you may not want to discuss this, I will say never borrow money. Well, you know what? I bought my first house borrowing for my 401k plan. People said, oh, no, you're robbing your retirement. And I said, no, I'm not. It's going to get me a house that will be equity, and that will go toward my retirement. Yeah. So don't expect this this blanket never borrow. Uh, there's good debt and there's bad debt. Debt to buy a house, in my view, is good debt. <laughs> so I would say, you know, uh, more more power to you because getting that is is a big step for financial security. You know, it's funny. I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, some some wealthy people who are in a totally different mind frame than I am. But, you know, they, they didn't have the student loan issue I had. They, they didn't have the how do I get to my first house? You know, when I, when I bought my first house in 2019 that, I, you know, I'm living in, I'm in right now. And um, it was very interesting. Their perspective about uh, Social Security benefits uh, specifically retirement, things like that, it was that the entire system to them was a fearful liability because the, the tax that comes with it uh, is not beneficial to them in any way and that whatever money they could potentially put into it, they could make more money off of it outside of it. And, um, you know, my argument was, you know, it's a social net. You don't want people without money. They'll be robbing you. They'll be jumping over the fences. You know, it, it'll be it'll be chaos. You don't want that. But it was a very interesting uh, viewpoint, uh, and, and they and one of the questions that I did not know how to answer, and I wished if I if my MBA ha had gone into it a little bit more. Um, but the, the the big question of okay, let's say you have three hundred million dollars, where would you park it? What would you do with it? How would it change your life? And um, structurally, I think that what, what's so interesting about it is that we have. Our goal in America is to get everybody to be wealthy enough to have a wonderful life, enjoy their freedoms and enjoy their, their spare time in a manner beyond just, you know, sitting in a chair. And um, unless you really like sitting in a chair, unless it's a nice chair, you know, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, I still have not mentally digested uh, their standpoint on things. But the questions they asked me about were, you know, essentially, okay, what's going on with legislation? What's going on with this, you know, 160,200, the cap, the donut, you know, lifting all that stuff and just charging us more and more. I know that, you know, with, with talking about, you know, how do they figure out how to tax, uh, you know, investments that haven't really rendered yet, or they have a better word for it, but, you know, when they've, when they've you know, shown a profit off of it, um, realized a profit, and I think what the interesting thing was at the end of the day, it it really showed me that people are on very different ends of the spectrum. And the only argument, and maybe you have a better argument, I'm hoping you do, because I'm going to meet with them again. But the only argument I really had for these individuals was you want this social net because if you don't have it, what you're going to end up with is far more chaos for the people that are part of the society society that you are. So I, I guess my question to you is, what would be your arguments to the super wealthy about essentially how they should approach potentially being taxed more for retirement? I think it's exactly the point you made. It's called social insurance for a couple of reasons. It's insurance that keeps society stable. Yeah. You will not be able to enjoy your wealth if the rest of your geographical neighborhood is in turmoil and you might say yeah but we've got big enough fences to protect ourselves you think so uh it's an insurance policy against social instability for the 
wealthy. And they've got to look at it that way. So your answer is to me is the most compelling answer. It's in your self-interest to make sure that the social insurance system provides a good enough source of economic security so that people aren't looking elsewhere to meet their needs. Elsewhere meaning you. <laughs> so right. I think your answer is exactly the right answer. You know, it's funny. There was there was a, an individual that was very savvy among the group. And I said, well, look, you know, they're going to get over the walls. They're coming. And then he said, well, I'll be on the island. And I said, yeah, but the products are made in America. They have to go to you. And he said, well, the, every product made in America is made somewhere else that can be shipped in. And I said, yeah, but you got to remember at the end of the day, like, you know, and, and this is where he got me. He said, culturally, this question, this talk is something you could have in America, but in other nations, they're given and they take what they can get and it just is what it is. And um, I don't have enough knowledge of cultural, like I don't know what's going on culturally in some of these small, you know, Asian countries, Asian island countries, maybe India or, you know, maybe the Middle East. I just don't know. And the, the thing for me is that um, as we continue into this future space oriented human race, it really does begin to beg the question of where are the super wealthy going to seek refuge? Where are they going to take their nationality and put their foot down? Because mo most, actually, I don't think any of them only had one uh, ticket. You know, uh, as, a, as a citizen of the United States, I don't have other places I could go as a citizen, you know, dual citizenship or even more. But all these wealthy, one of the big ticket items that they collect, and they even know how much it is to, you know, buy your citizenship with your investments and things like that. They've all got two, three, four citizenships. And um, I don't know, what is your thought on that with, with how the wealthy in the future will interact with U.S. taxes when it comes to Social Security? And I know that's a tough question. I know it ahead of time. If you don't want to answer it, totally fine. But, but what are your well, thoughts? Yeah. Really, uh, what is yeah. it? Doesn't, doesn't keep it. This is not a question that keeps me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> but I understand where you're coming from because when all is said done, the wealthy are the powerful interests of the of the country of the world. Um, I try to keep kind of loose tabs on which countries are attracting uh, high net worth Americans. New Zealand seems to be a place that's doing it. And I don't know enough about New Zealand other than to become a citizen of New Zealand, you must have net worth above a certain amount. Yeah. So they made it very clear, low-income, middle-income people are not welcome here. So um, something's going on there that's probably worth looking at. I spent uh, Christmas in Montreal, and sure. as my wife and daughter and I landed, the newspapers had a headline, the parliament just passed the law, Canadians are prohibited from selling their homes to non-Canadians. Can you imagine that? Of uh, no exceptions, no. It didn't say to non Canadians with incomes under a certain amount, right. they can't sell it. Who do you think that's directed at? Oh yeah, you know who the neighbor to the south, right? Yeah. So um, it's a fascinating idea, but I have not uh, looked at the other country that's there's a buzz about. And again, I don't know why it's Portugal. Portugal seems to be the new hot country to attract American retirees who want to mm -hmm. leave the United States. But I know enough about what's going on in Portugal to uh, be able to assess it. Well, I'm excited because now we have our next video topic uh, where we got to bring you on. So <laughs> this is good. <laughs> this is very good. So um, real quick, I, I have a. I, I want to ask the the general chat section group. We've got about 220 sure. people uh, watching. Um, guys, let me know. Put your questions at the bottom uh, so that we can go ahead and and basically ask them uh, to Mr. Arnold real quick so that he can kind of go through and explain them. Um, and, and let's see, we've got, uh, I'm just going to scroll up a little bit. Um, there's a lot of comments and some of them are quite sassy, which is good. Um, <laughs> let's see, let's see what we got here. Um, okay. So they're talking about, okay. So is there any, and I remember, remember how I said to them at the very beginning of the video, before even I called you, I said, look guys, stay away from politics. But the first question that popped up <laughs> is, um, is there any political interest in expanding social security benefits? And I want to add to that. The real thing I see in all these other YouTube channels, and, and, and you can maybe speak more directly to it, is this whole idea of a stimulus for the disabled, the stimulus for the retired, 
And I've been watching the Bills and they're, they're fluff Bills when they do come out in various forms. But is there any interest in expanding Social Security or doing a stimulus for Social Security benefits right now? Yes, there is. Um, there's one advocacy group that your listeners should know about. It's called Social Security Works. Now, I run a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-advocacy group, the National Academy of Social Insurance. So we only provide evidence-based studies. We don't take positions. But Social Security Works takes positions. They're, all, they're the leaders of the expand Social Security movement. Uh, the benefit is too low for too many people. They would like to see either a targeted or a cost the board benefit increase. And Elizabeth Warren at one point was floating an across-the-board $600 increase, not a month, but for the year. Uh, other versions are around 200 across the board. You might say, well, that's not a lot. But for some people, that could be a lot. Then there's a part of Social Security that disappeared that a lot of folks would like to bring back, and that's the minimum benefit. The minimum benefit said if your Social Security formula based on your wages over your 35 year working career is too low, you'll get the minimum benefit instead. It was a way to provide a guaranteed income to all social security beneficiaries. There's a lot of interest in bringing that back. So I would say that one is worth keeping an eye on. Those would be what I would call the two big expansions. There's a third area, a lot of um, 80 year old plus widows, mostly uh, women, are in deep poverty. The poverty rate is going up. So a lot of people would like to see a special Social Security benefit directed at uh, older widows, and that would be another expansion of Social Security. Those are all being discussed. The chance of being, being enacted at a time when the Social Security trust funds are having trouble is the challenge, but there is a movement out there to do that. Another question um, from, let's see, and people want to know this one. They 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 copy and pasted it. Um, who or what lobbyists are for cutting and gutting Social Security benefits? Well, um, they're not uh, all lobbyists. They're uh, a couple of think tanks that are dedicated to reducing the role of Social Security for ideological reasons. The uh, two that are most prominent are the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation. They've been promoting reduction in Social Security since the middle 60s. They have a whole strategy to cast doubt on Social Security's future, especially among young workers. Um, they also don't lobby, though, but they have tremendous influence based on the uh, support they have. So they've been rather strong in trying to reduce the role of Social Security. And it's really based on ideology. They believe that each of us should be able to take care of ourselves and not be dependent on the government for pretty much anything. So those, I think, are the two big forces trying to cut Social Security benefits. Another question uh, from Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, why don't the military have to contribute their 6.2% uh, part of the active pay of veterans? Now, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, everybody pays in, except for certain state uh, government employees. So I'm not familiar with the military being exempt from paying in. I'm not familiar with that at all. Yeah, neither am I. I'll have to. I'll have to look that up. Um, let me yeah, see if there's. Yeah, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, and then okay, so that's basically. And then we've got. Uh, let's see. And then most of the people are talking about how to like you know prep for the bad times. You know the, the farm fresh eggs, things like that. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the, the prepper. And I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, you never know. Um, okay. So, um, I have a, a final question. Um, can you walk me through or give me a summary as to what the national Academy of social insurance is and what are the upcoming topics, uh, and articles that you're going to be producing that we can look out for? Thank you. That's a great question. It gives me a chance to provide a commercial for our uh, nonprofit. First of all, I encourage your listeners to go on our website, nasi.org, and sign up. We have a sign up. You'll get um, regular publications from us. You'll be kept apprised. And again, we're nonpartisan. We believe in facts, not ideology. So we'll try to present um, objective, evidence based reports. We have two big reports coming out soon, and I'm very excited. One is on what difference did COVID 19 make to social insurance and related programs? How did these programs respond? 
And most importantly, what have we learned from this pandemic that can prepare Social Security, SSI, Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, the employer retention tax credit, uh, all these programs that together are supposed to help people uh, provide a level of economic security. What did we learn in anticipation of the next big thing? And we know there will be a next big thing. It could be another pandemic. It could be a war. It could be a cybersecurity attack. It could be a climate disaster. It's inevitable that there'll be something else. What have we learned so we can prepare and do a better job offsetting the negative effects of those types of shocks? So that's one task force report that'll be coming out. I, I'm hoping to get that out before this month of April is over. We have a second task force that I don't know how many of your viewers might be in this category. Older workers who are in jobs that are so physically demanding, they are really not able to continue to work, but they have to. Why? They're too young for a Social Security retirement benefit. You must be at least 62. And they're not disabled under the very strict, as you know, definition of disability. They're in a twilight zone. What can we do for this segment of the population to get them over the hump so they can have some degree of economic security in their retirement years. So we'll have a report. And our reports list policy options, but we don't recommend one over the other. We let readers and advocacy groups take our reports and they can then decide, I'd like to support policy option A or policy option B. We just lay out the options. We don't make recommendations. Excellent. Well, excellent. Good, sir. And, a, and a side note to that, uh, AARP basically uh, uh, has a hiring system for the uh, for the homeless help center that I work at on Wednesdays, um, where there's an individual there where they basically pay the hourly fee of that person to be there. And it's incredible because, you know, it, it's it's giving somebody an opportunity to directly help those who are in need and at the same time get an income for a not physically aggressive job. And um, I got I got to, you know, applaud uh, for that, you know, particular group, ARP, because I know it's not cheap, but it is a good solution to that uh, problem. Not a huge solution, but definitely a good start to it. But um, good, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I always get super excited. I, uh, I, I did a bunch of things to kind of prepare for this. And number one, I got a haircut. So I just... <laughs> <laughs> Why do you know? Um, I wanted to be prepared, look good. And then the other thing too, which was the really big thing, which is that this was the first time I think within the past four years that I've actually started the show on time. So I uh, <laughs> just wanted to let you know, this was, that, that this is a big thing for me. Um, I would love to get you back on the show. Um, when you, Anytime. yeah, when you release those articles, please, 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 um, reach out. I'm going to reach out as well because, um, the future of social security benefits. What do we do with the pandemic? How is it going to affect it? That's massive. And it's something that no one is focusing on. So I, I applaud you, good sir. You know, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Excellent. Have a wonderful, wonderful night and I'll catch up in the not too distant future. Bye bye. Thank you. Good sir. Bye bye. So guys, I want to explain real quick why that is a hero of you. Literally, you guys, the retired, the disabled, disabled or child benefits, SSI benefits, survivor's benefits, spousal benefits, you, auxiliary benefits, you. That is a person who quite literally takes all of the reports, has a huge team of people. They go through them all in detail. Then they write summary reports that answer the tough questions that would take uh, an entire separate organization to even think about. And what's beautiful about it is that we have all these reports coming out, all these numbers coming out from these different groups, whether it's an accountant or a lawyer or it's the SSA, whatever. You have all these reports coming out and they take them and they do the tough questions and try and pull the data and make it useful for those particularly difficult questions. That was the president, the CEO of the National Academy for Social Insurance based in Washington, D.C. So just as a side note, it is an incredible honor to have that person on the channel. And I want you to understand that it's, it's a huge deal. Um, I'm going to be doing a video summary specifically on the meeting he had with the chief actuary of the SSA yesterday. He had that Wednesday. I don't know if it's up on YouTube yet. I was looking for it. The person who probably has some of the best idea, like finger on the pulse of what's going on in social security land, 
is that person right there. We are going to have other wonderful individuals coming on the show that are directly tied to the Social Security Administration in some way, manner, or form. These are the heavyweights. We're going to be doing some huge shows. So please remember to like, subscribe, and leave five-star reviews. I love seeing those five-star reviews. If you Google disability resolution, and then you leave a five-star review for the law firm, disability resolution, I love them. When I wake up and I see a five-star review, it makes me feel good. Not as good as waking up and my dogs just loving on me and you know just demanding belly rubs and kisses and food. Not as much as that, but it is a close fourth on the it's you know there's other stuff either you know i i like food in the morning i do but with that said i just want to let you know this is a really incredible incredible day and an incredible moment and his his knowledge base is so massive you know you guys don't realize how few of people in america have a knowledge base about this niche field that affects millions upon millions of people it's, it's, it, you know what I mean? It's just odd. And, and let me explain to you something. The people that work at the social security administration at the lower levels, they're not thinking about policy changes at high level. What are the new laws coming out? What's the thing that's going to change this, how it's going to happen. They're not thinking about that. When I talk with people at the hearing office about legal changes that are potentially coming as a result of bills that have been presented by house reps, senators, etc., a lot of them don't know what's going to happen. I need you to understand that people like Mr. Arnone, are a gem. And we have to foster a, a, a situation where we bolster the potential of that organization. So with that said, and I want to do this, and I think it's incredibly important, and please, 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 here, I'm, I'm going to get it right now. Um, uh, Academy of, so hold on, I'm pulling it up. I'm grabbing you the link, okay? National Academy of Social Insurance, right here, hold on. Can you please right now, as I'm going to be ending this video shortly, oh, it won't let me do it. All right, here's what you're going to search. You're going to go to Google. I need you to search National Academy of Social Insurance. Search that on Google, please. DuckDuckGo, Yahoo Search, whatever. Search it. Please leave them a five-star review because your benefits – and the big titled people out there that make the decisions as to how good your year is going to be are reliant on the articles that his nonprofit creates. They're one of the few out there that is neutral and considers all. And in the modern world that we live in, that is incredibly rare. Um, I'm very glad to hear that he's safe, even though there was a, a, a tornado issue, which is just it's mind boggling. Um, I'm very glad to hear that he could make the show because he's incredibly important to me and incredibly important to social security benefits in general and in total. Um, guys, okay, so I did not see, uh, Marjan, I did not see your question. Uh, yes, National Academy of Social Insurance. Uh, go ahead and Google it. Please leave them a five-star review. Let me see if I can find uh, Marjan's question real quick. Hold on, let me scroll up. Scroll, 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 scroll. Still don't see it. Still don't see it. Still don't see it. Still don't see it. But help me out and just put it at the bottom because there's a gajillion comments here. Um, I see a donation here. For, oh, there it is, all the way top. What about the $200 increase also win? All right, I'm going to do a, a video on the $200 increase so you guys know specifically which bill, which you know politician is pushing that, um, why other channels have been talking about it so much. Um, I, I got gotcha. you. I'll do a video on that. I'll do a video on the $600 notification. I'll do a video on what Bernie Sanders is promoting, uh, what he's been saying recently, et cetera. Guys, I will catch you at the next video. Give me about five to 10 minutes, and that's the video where you call in. Please remember, um, don't call in repetitively when I'm on the phone. Just when I'm getting off the phone, call in, and then I'll take the next caller. We are interviewing people right now who might be able to go ahead and work with us while we're live as a person to handle the incoming calls and then basically send them and direct them through this technology box uh, that basically, ooh, my chair there, that will basically allow us to go ahead and have a better lineup. Now for this next video, when we do the calls, remember we're shooting for five minutes per call. If you call with a fake name, I ask you, can I answer a question for you? Can I run hearing questions with you? I hope, I hope, I hope tonight, I hope, I'm staring you down, I hope tonight 
we can have one caller. I'm just asking for one, just one, who will go ahead and run hearing questions with me where I can use the most diabolical, sinister hearing questions I can think of. I'm just saying, nobody gives me the love to do that. I want the love. All right, I will catch you guys uh, basically in five to 10 minutes. Please remember, excellent job, moderator. Uh, the 407 uh, 279 1754. That's how you call in. I will be back in five to 10 minutes. Thank you so much. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye guys. Bye-bye.